It is now time for our third lecture in the Did God Really Say Conference. This presentation is brought to you by Chris Rosebro of Fire Christian Media. He hails from the impressively flat prairie of Grand Forks, North Dakota. I'd like to thank the uh, organizers of the Did God Really Say conference for inviting me. My name is Chris Rosebro. I host the uh, YouTube channel Fighting for the Faith. And today I'm going to be speaking on the topic of the slanderous injustice of CRT and social justice. Seems like a weird thing to say, right? I mean, isn't social justice all about justice? No, it's not. And you'll see this as soon as we start applying some basic biblical concepts, and I mean basic. The major problem within the Christian church today is an alarming rate of, well, biblical illiteracy. So if you would, I, I know what I'm going to say today is going to end up relying heavily upon the basics of a biblical and Christian worldview, but those of you out there in the trenches fighting CRT, fighting social justice, you're doing a yeoman's work and you need some biblical backing, some biblical argumentations, and this gets back to basic presuppositions, especially as it relates to, of all things, the Ten Commandments. You'll see what I'm saying as we uh, unpack all of this. So let's whirl up the desktop, and uh, I'm going to use Keynote to help me keep myself organized. And so we're going to begin with a, a, a personal anecdotal story. You know, going back to when I was at uh, uh, Christ College, Irvine, uh, also known as uh, Concordia University, Irvine, when I was a young man, I did something kind of foolish. L let me explain. I ended up, when I was at the university, doing all of my courses that I needed for my major, <laughs> I did them in the first two years of college, which meant <laughs> I had to spend my junior and senior years in college doing basic courses, you know, the stuff that everybody does. Anyway, so I got to my senior year at Concordia University, and I was required to take a course. Uh, I, I was required to take a course on, well, you know, kind of social problems, kind of, kind of a generic thing. And so this particular course, because it was just, you know, your basic course, you know, that was required that for everybody to take, uh, the, uh, the, the professor who taught it, she was a rent-a-prof. They, they rented her from uh, Cal State University, Long Beach, and she was openly in the Christian University. She was openly an avowed communist. She was an absolute card-carrying Marxist, and she didn't have any problem telling that to people. So what she ended up doing, you know, this world problems course, uh, she ended up allowing us, because she was so innovative, us students, we students, she allowed us to actually teach on the different problems. And so what she did is she took the curriculum, the the, the major cor you know course curriculum in the in the textbook, and she pulled out the different world problems that we would be covering in the course of our quarter in this class, and she put them in a hat, shook the hat up, divided us into teams of two because you know, Concordia Irvine's a small university, broke us up into teams of two, and then passed the hat around. And me and my my partner, we were given, uh, well, by random chance, the uh, the world problem known as the global divide. Have you have you ever heard of the global divide? See, the basic premise goes something like this: you know, there are first world nations, there are second world nations, and there are third world nations. And when you look at the distribution of wealth and resources on planet Earth among first, second, and third world nations, you have discovered that there is a disparity, a disparity 
disparity between the consumption of resources within first world nations as compared to third world nations. And see, this is a global problem, at least the way it was presented in the, t in the course. And so me and my partner were given this problem. And after reading the textbook, we were then required to present this this problem to our class, discuss it, and then as part of our assignment, since we were teaching on it, not the professor, we were supposed to propose a solution to the problem, okay? So the problem of the global divide. Well, after reading the textbook, it was very painfully clear that uh, the, 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 the basic premise here is, is the inequality of outcome as it relates to wealth distribution and the use of world resources. So I was pretty convinced after reading the, uh, the textbook that uh, once you grant the premise, well, the, so the solution logically follows. And the problem is the way everything was set up is that the only solution is global communism. I know it seems it's kind of weird, but I'll walk you through this. So I told my uh, <laughs> my partner, I said to her, I said, you know, I think what we should probably do is do this. I think we should just go with it. And that we should, in our presentation, not only present the problem of the global divide, but that what we should also do is take a hard line and basically tell the, that the solution has to be global communism and that uh, we need to inform the, uh, the students in our class that they're going to have to turn in their cars and stuff like that. And we're going to have to set up a, an equitable system where nobody has more than anybody else. So when it came time a few weeks later for my partner and I to present, uh, we had enough lead time that that was the first time I grew out a goatee. And I grew out the goatee in order to make it look, make myself look more like, uh, you know, Lenin, you know, the Bolshevik revolution, Lenin from, uh, from Russia. And uh, we had secured two Mao hats. Uh, my parents, when, uh, when I was a child, they traveled to China. And back in the day, they brought back as souvenirs from my brother and I, uh, Mao hats from China. So my partner and I, we both wore Mao hats. I grew out my Lenin goatee. And we proceeded then to uh, make our presentation. And I basically laid it out like this. And my partner, she did her part. I did my part. It was just glorious. You basically said, here's the problem. The, the, the first world nations are consuming and using global resources at a rate that isn't even close to the same as people in third world nations. Third world nations, people who live there, they don't have access to the same resources, to the same money, to the same finances as we do in the first world, and this is unfair. And so we are proposing as the solution to the global disparity that is taking place, this uh, unequal outcome, if you would, globally. Uh, we are proposing that a central communist agency be established immediately that the U.S. Constitution be wiped out, and that all of you students here at Concordia University, Irvine, if you drive a car, you're going to need to turn it in. And if you have more than two sets of clothes, you're going to need to turn those in. And everybody in the class will be assigned, given a bicycle, a bag of rice, a menial desk job, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, two sets of clothes. That's it. And that way, because, I mean, we can't, we can't, it's impossible for us to distribute and redistribute wealth equitably where everybody would be wealthy, but we can uh, redistribute poverty equally. That's the one thing we're capable of doing. And, <laughs> and when it came time for class discussion on this, all oh, let's just say that the discussion was quite heated. Are you, what are you saying? Are you, you saying that we're, it's, and I basically looked them all in the face and said, it's unfair. It's unfair that you have more, that you have a car, that you're going to college. It's unfair. People who live in other countries, they don't have access to these resources. They don't have cars. They walk. They don't even have access to, to, uh, to plumbing. They have to travel to get, uh, clean water. So, you know, it's not fair that you have these things. You're going to have to hand them over and we're going to perfectly redistribute poverty to everybody. And here's the thing. None of the students were capable of out-arguing me. 
And there's a simple reason why, and I'll explain it here. I already said it, but I'll explain it. So if we open up our desktop, here's the thing. Once you grant the premise, the conclusion automatically follows. Once you grant the premise that there's some kind of a sin or immorality that has taken place as a result of unequal outcomes, some people have more money than other people, well, and some people use more resources than other people, once you grant the premise that this is somehow morally reprehensible and wrong, the conclusion automatically follows. We must set up a system where nobody has more than anybody else period, regardless of where they live. And the only solution is Marxism. And at the end of the class, I looked everybody in the face and I told them straight out, the reason why you couldn't out-argue me is because you didn't see the trap in the logic. Once you grant the premise, the conclusion automatically follows. And that's the problem with CRT and so-called social justice. This is just to set the frame. So we're going to, we're going to watch uh, part of a video from Robin DiAngelo. And this was a, uh, this is a video, you can find it on YouTube, called Deconstructing White Privilege with Dr. Robin DiAngelo. And this is put out by the General Commission on Religion and Race of the United Methodist Church. So this is a this is a church issue now. This is not politics. This is something very different. And we're going to biblically and using just sound logic take apart what she is saying. Now this is going to require us to do this like I said fighting for the faith style. And we're going to listen carefully to what she says and how she says it and we're going to show you how this is totally contrary to the Ten Commandments, especially the commandment that says, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is a vital one. And here's the thing. So many Christians have not been properly discipled. They do not know their Ten Commandments. They do not understand what they mean. And the Ten Commandments, you've, you're going to need to become an expert on them immediately the best way I can put it, because real justice is based upon real morals and sound ethics. And the only place to go to find that is the Ten Commandments. But let's, uh, let's listen in to, as Robin D'Angelo uh, deconstructs white privilege, shall we? I'm Dr. Robin D'Angelo, and my work focuses on the question of what does it mean to be white in a society that proclaims race meaningless, yet is profoundly separated by race. And to start this off, I want to draw your attention to the fact that I'm white. So just look at me for a moment, think about it, notice it. And part of being white is that is a very uncomfortable thing for me to do. And it's taken me many, many years to be able to draw people's attention to my race and see any significance in it. And that's because as a white person, I was socialized to see race as what they had. I was just a person. I, I was just a white bread, a Heinz 57. Uh, I didn't have race. I was socialized to see race as individual acts of discrimination and prejudiced. Now, this is the part where we have to pay close attention to what she is saying. And I mean close. I was, quote, socialized to see racism as individual acts of discrimination and prejudice. You know, individuals breaking the commandment, thou shall not murder. Now, the reason I say that, by the way, in, in fact, let's kind of do this. Let's kind of get this out on the text, out, out on, the, on the table. All right. Uh, Exodus 2013, you shall not murder. Absolutely forbidden by God. You shall not murder. That being the case, it's important for us to recognize how Christ uses this text. Uh, Christ says this, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So the commandment 
thou shalt not murder not only forbids us from putting a knife in the back of somebody and then burying their body in the desert, the commandment thou shalt not murder also requires us to love our neighbor. In fact, Jesus makes it clear that all of the law and all of the commandments hang on to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So loving neighbor, the keeping of this commandment against murder requires us to not hate other people and to act in their regard to help them protect the things that are necessary for their body and their life and to protect their lives themselves. In fact, putting it another way, 1 John says this, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. In other words, true racism, which is hatred of other people, other human beings whom God has created, it's a breaking of this commandment. First John 4 says this, Beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And so you'll know in dealing with evil as it relates to true racism, she said, quote, I was socialized to see racism as individual acts of discrimination and prejudice. Well, it is. Just like hating somebody is an individual act of hatred, you know, and murder, right? And, you know, so you, you, we got a problem here. We got a big problem because what she is doing is deconstructing the real definition of real sin and real evil in order to replace it with a definition that is contrary to scripture and ends up by default and just flat out breaking the commandment that says thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. I'll explain. So let me back this up, listen to the important words. Just a white bread, a Heinz 57. Uh, I didn't have race. I was socialized to see race as individual acts of discrimination and prejudice, individual acts that anybody could do to anybody else. Yeah, the, the way Jesus in the Bible describes things, yeah. And if you did those acts, you were a bad person. Now, I'm going to make it aside here. If you did these acts, you were a bad person. You'll note she's teaching a group of United Methodist people on a United Methodist channel. Scripture doesn't teach that you are a bad person because you do bad things. Scripture teaches that each and every one of us is, was born conceived, dead in trespasses and sins. We are born with the condition of sin. The reason we sin is because we are sinners. Not, you know, committing a sin doesn't make you a sinner. No, no, no. You sinned because you are a sinner. So note, her worldview is completely backwards. I'm a good person unless I do bad things. Wrong. Scripture teaches that each and every one of us are guilty before God and, and have an inherited sinful nature that we got from Adam and Eve. We sin because we are sinners. So note that this worldview that she's putting forward, contrary to Scripture. You see, you know, Committing acts of racism do, doesn't make you a bad person. You're a bad person. Therefore, you may be guilty. And I notice I said may. You may be guilty of committing acts of racism. That's the difference. So back this acts up. Acts of discrimination and prejudice. Individual acts that anybody could do to anybody else. And if you did those acts, you were a bad person. And that is why, since I saw myself as a good person, I didn't see myself as connected to racism. And there's your problem. None of us is good. None is good. No, not one. No one seeks God. See Romans chapter 3. Uh, and certainly didn't see myself as connected to race. In other words, I didn't have a sense of a racial identity. Today I understand that I move through the world always and most particularly as a white person. I have a white frame of reference and I have a white experience. And part of being white is to have that be invisible to us and to be able to live our lives without ever acknowledging that, to see that as non-operative. I now so note she's now hinting at this idea and she'll develop it further that that white people are racist all of them and they are for the most part completely oblivious to it hmm. understand racism as a system 
Okay, now I'm gonna back this up. Listen again how she's going to define racism. Non-operative. I now understand racism as a system, as a deeply embedded system, a system that our country was founded on and that all our institutions were created out of. And every institution reinforces the system. Okay, I'm going to read the quote again. Here's her definition. And this is a direct quote. Racism is a system, a deeply embedded system a system that our country was founded on and that all of our institutions were creative out of and every institution reinforces this system. That's a direct quote. In fact, let's do this. Let's pull this up. And here's the quote so that you can see it again. Let's deconstruct this. Racism is a system, she says, a deeply embedded system, a system that our country was founded on that all of our institutions were created out of, and every institution reinforces this system. So remember what I said. Once you grant the premise, the conclusion automatically follows. And here's where you can see and smell the rat. Let me kind of put it out to you this way. Racism. Remember what she says. Racism is a system. And she said that our country was founded on it, and that our institutions were created out of it, and every institution reinforces this system. So racism is the thing, it's the system, and out of racism came our constitution. And our constitution is the thing that created our legis legislative branch, our executive branch, and our judiciary. And according to her definition, our system, all of our institutions were created out of racism for the purpose of perpetuating racism. So racism created the Constitution, which created these three branches of government, which were created for the purpose of perpetuating racism. Listen to the quote again. Racism is a system, a deeply embedded system, a system our country was founded on and that all of our institutions were created out of and every institution reinforces this system. The Constitution was created out of, out of racism. The governmental branches, the three of them, were created out of racism and for the purpose of reinforcing racism racism. Well, let's kind of see if that makes any sense. Could you imagine, you know, the founding fathers, you know, a conversation kind of going something like this at the Independence Hall there in Philadelphia. Racism is the best thing ever. I really enjoy hating and oppressing everyone who does not have white skin. How can we take racism to the next level? Hmm. Well, we could declare our independence from England. We would have to win the war that would ensue and then form a government that will institutionalize racial oppression and grant privilege to everyone with white skin. And you can see somebody going over there and going, oh, that's a fantastic and revolutionary idea. Yeah, here's the thing. That's a Marxist myth. But like I said, once you grant the premise the conclusion automatically follows. In other words, the only way to save us from racism is to eliminate the Constitution and the institutions that it created, the three branches of government, because they were all created by racism in order to reinforce racism. You see the problem here? Once you grant the premise, the conclusion automatically follows. And here's the issue. This explains why, uh, you, know, the, you, know, you know, the Antifa and the Black Lives Matter group, they're not interested in reforming the police. They want to defund the police. Why? Because they're not interested in reforming the system, you know, the constitutional republic that we all currently enjoy our freedoms under, they want to eliminate the constitution and the three branches of government and put something else in its place. Because once you grant the premise, 
the conclusion automatically follows. In other words, if it's true that racism is the system, a deeply embedded system, a system that our country was founded on and that all of our institutions were created out of and every institution then reinforces the system of racism, then here's the thing. If you are a, an American patriot, flag-waving American patriot, you're a racist. Defending the Constitution makes you a racist. Well, yeah. There's, that makes you a racist. Oh, and, you know, even if you don't wave the flag, well, you know, if you're, if you're a white guy and you, you, it looks like you've made a, a little bit of money, the only way you were able to make that money and succeed is because the whole system was set up in order to give you privileges that other people don't have. You know, just being a successful white person makes you a racist, right? Because remember, racism is a system. It's a deeply embedded system, a system that our country was founded on, that all of our institutions were created out of, and every institution reinforces that system. That also means that if you have darker skin and you are a flag-waving, constitution-loving American, that makes you a race traitor. You see it now? And you're going to note here by saying that just by being an American makes you a racist? Loving the Constitution makes you a racist? Being a white person makes you a racist? Or having dark skin and defending the Constitution makes you a race traitor? What's really going on here? Well, what's really going on here is a breaking of this commandment from Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You see, racism is a real sin. Hatred of your neighbor is a real problem. And there are real people who really hate, and I truly mean this, down to the bottom of their soles of their feet, they hate people who have different colored skin than they do. And it doesn't matter whether their, their skin color is white or dark or brown or a different color altogether. That sin is something we're all capable of doing and people across the spectrum of colors of skin color are guilty of racism, true racism. But in this definition, in this definition of racism, D'Angelo's definition, the only people who could be racists are white people. That's not justice, that's slander. You see the difference? And so once you grant the premise, the conclusion automatically follows. This isn't about racism. This is about a slanderous lie about our nation and about you. That racism is the very foundation of our society and our constitutional republic. And by the way, this also then would apply for those of you living in the United Kingdom or any European uh, you know, republic or in Australia. You, you, you're, you're all racist too. <laughs> You see the problem here? This is slander, which is an injustice. So we'll talk more about this here. So you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That requires us to speak the truth about our neighbor and to not level charges against them that cannot be substantiated. But let's come back to D'Angelo. So D'Angelo here, I'm going to fast forward just a little bit to the three minute, two second mark. And we're gonna continue with her discussion and just listen more as she explains things. But she's already made it clear, racism is a system. All right, let's keep listening. The civil rights movement, it was fairly socially acceptable for white people to just come out and say, we are superior. My father certainly was comfortable saying that. The great joke of Archie Bunker and all of the family was that he wasn't up with the times and he was still saying um, things that conveyed this idea. But post-civil rights, it became bad to be racist, right? It became unacceptable to be racist. and that It was always a sin to be a racist. According to the Ten Commandments, absolutely always a sin to be a racist. To hate your neighbor, and scripture and Christianity is completely antithetical to it. 
That seems like a positive thing, right? Racism's bad. But unfortunately, what it morphed into is to make it impossible for white people to look at racism because what we hear is, I would have to be a bad person in order to perpetuate racism. It became a moral issue. It, uh, it is a moral issue. That's kind of the point, is that racism is and always has been a moral issue. It's been a breaking of the commandment, thou shalt not murder. And it's a form of hatred, which God absolutely abhors and punishes. And for anybody who calls themselves a Christian and they hate their neighbor, well, scripture is clear. You, you, don't, you don't even know who God is. Uh-huh. So note what she's doing here. She's taking this out of the realm that it actually exists in in order to, well, redefine racism. Racism you're not even aware of. Racism that you commit daily without even knowing it, you know, by defending the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That's really where this goes. We continue. In addition to years of reflection and study of my own racial identity and how it shapes my life and my experience and my perspectives, I've had the very rare opportunity to, for a living, day in and day out, lead primarily white groups of people in discussions of race and racism. And there are some very, very predictable patterns that come up in these conversations. Yeah, watch with the patterns. So she's gonna not try to knock all these down. But by doing that, what she's trying to establish is her slanderous narrative that you are absolutely a racist, even if you don't hate anybody, even if you actually love your neighbor. Hmm. And as I listen to these, it's almost like a script, right? That like, it's almost as if as white folks, we're, we just pick up this script and we say the same things again and again and again. And as a sociologist, rather than seeing something that's patterned as meaning therefore it's true, I look at something patterned as, as very revealing of how we get socialized to see things and to see the world. And then the next question that follows that is, and so how does that function? Right? And when we look around us, we can see that although we have changes since the civil rights movement and we have this idea of racism being bad, we still have the same unequal outcomes by race. Unequal outcomes. Really. Anybody who says that they can politically promise equal outcomes is selling you a pipe dream. Jesus makes it clear, the poor you will always have with you. The unequal outcomes that we experience in this life, and some of that is the result, the consequence of, of our collective sin. There are absolutely social and economic injustices. This is absolutely true. And believe me, as soon as you try to solve the problem in one area, it'll crop up in another. Human greed is as predictable as ever. So there will never be the same outcome. And here's the thing. The Marxists are trying to convince you, oh, just give us all of your, give us all power. Concede over your freedoms and your liberty. And we promise that everybody will be equal. But we have seen this over and over again. Everywhere that communism has been tried, the only thing that it can spread equally is misery and poverty. That's straight up the truth. Now, in our society, then, is it terrible that there are such huge economic, well, inequalities? In some cases, absolutely. Absolutely. But not always. That's the thing. As soon as you assume that it is immoral or wrong, that there is an unequal outcome, now we've got a different problem altogether. Okay, you don't have any basis for making such a claim. And those who claim, oh, we're going to make everything equal, the only thing they can spread equally is misery. Keep that in mind. By every measure, we have racial inequality. So how do we have such different narratives than we had prior to the civil rights movement and still have unequal outcomes? And as I listen to white folks, my group, um, repeat these narratives over and over, I got this image of a dock, like a pier, and it's just floating on the water. You got this image. Do you get a download from God? And that's all the superficial things that we say. And you probably recognize some of these. You hear them. Maybe you've said them yourself. I don't see color. I was taught to treat everybody the same. Here's the thing. When people say these things, what are they doing? They're defending themselves against the slander that they 
are racists. And this is evidence that they're putting forward. Let me explain to you biblically what needs to happen in order to establish a charge. So um, let's kind of we'll start here. Okay, so in Proverbs 6, note, note things here. There are six things that the Lord, the God hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Number one, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies. Note, do not lie and think that it's a small thing. And do not lie against entire groups of people and think that it's a small thing. God hates this. So, and the one who sows discord among brothers. Keep that in mind. So, all of that being said, <clears throat> Scripture has a threshold. By the way, the idea that you are innocent until proven guilty, that comes from the Bible. Straight up from the Bible. In fact, here, here's the standard. Deuteronomy 17.6. On the evidence of two witnesses or of three the one who is to die shall be put to death. A person shall not be put to death on the evidence of one witness. Scripture set up a threshold, a, a, a system of, just, of justice, and that is, is that charges had to be leveled against a person and the charges substantiated by evidence. Flat out. Deuteronomy 19.15, a single witness shall not suffice against a person for any crime or for any wrong in connection with an, any offense that has, that has been committed. Only on the evidence of two witnesses or of three shall a charge be established. You see, God knows full well that human beings lie about each other. Mm -hmm. So there was the idea of our judicial system of, of the judges, of there actually being evidence presented, somebody being presumed innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, that, that comes from God, all right? So, um, and then notice when it comes to, you know, even church discipline, you know, if, if he doesn't listen to the person who is brought, you know, who said you need to repent, take one or two others along with you so that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Uh, Paul writes, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Um, 1 Timothy 5, 19, I'm a pastor. Do not admit a charge against an elder, a pastor, except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. Uh-huh. So, and you'll note that Jesus himself, he, the, the reason he was able to be put to death is because of the abuse of governmental power by the high priest. They brought forward false witnesses to testify against Jesus. So they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward. Two came forward to testify against Christ. And that was... Uh, and that was how Jesus was put to death because the, the false witnesses came forward. Now, here's the thing. The systems are set up. No system is perfect. People are capable of manipulating and abusing systems. But the abuse of a system is not the same as saying that the system itself was set up for the purpose of oppressing people. In fact, I'm going to note something here. Using the biblical standard that's required, let me come back to uh, D'Angelo's definition. Racism is a system, a deeply embedded system, a system that our country was founded on, that our institutions were created out of, and every institution reinforces this system. Notice here, what she has done is she has slandered, and I mean it, she has borne false witness against the founders of the nation of the United States. Because my question is, well, if racism is a system that our whole system was, that our, that our constitution was founded on racism, where's the evidence for that? What witnesses can you bring forward that will substantiate and prove this claim, this allegation that you've brought forward, that the United States was founded on racism and that the institutions of our government the three branches of government were created out of racism for the purpose of reinforcing racism. You see, Scripture is clear that when it comes to establishing a charge, 
You actually need to bring witnesses forward. But note that D'Angelo, what she is doing here is she's playing the role of a gossip. That's what she's become. She's a, she's a busybody. She has, well, arrogated to herself authority to be judge of the United States and of all white people. And you'll note that in her presentation, oh, this is behavior that I see. Every time we talk about institutionalized racism, people predictably say things like, I was taught to treat everyone the same. I see people as individuals. Racism is in the past. You see, what are they doing? They're pro providing evidence to do what? To prove their innocence. But here's the thing. Our system and the system that God set up when it comes to justice does not require us to prove our innocence. They have to prove our guilt. This is all backwards. But their natural inclination is to go to evidence. And she's going to demean that. She's going to demean it. But before we get to her, I, 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 and before we come back, I would like to, you to consider the words of Martin Luther, the reformer Martin Luther. In the large catechism, Martin Luther provides a series of sermons on the Ten Commandments, and they are fantastic. They are absolutely fantastic sermons to help us understand God's law and what real justice is, and how by breaking these commandments, we commit injustices against each other. But when it comes to this commandment, you shall bear false, do not bear false witness against your neighbor, I want you to hear the words of Luther from his sermon uh, against, the, you know, against slander. Here's what he says, besides our own body, our wife or our husband, and our temporal property, we have one more treasure which is indispensable to us, namely our honor and our good name. For it is intolerable to live among men in public disgrace and contempt. And I would note this, that CRT and social justice is, te is slanderously saying that all white people, just by virtue of being white, and anybody, any flag-waving patriot in the United States, they are a racist, and the whole system is a racist system devised to oppress people, that what they have done is take away the good name and honor of people who've committed no such sins or crimes. And there has been, they have been accused and found guilty without any evidence whatsoever. And so they've taken away the good name of many millions of people. And this is a sin. Therefore, God will not have our neighbor, neighbor deprived of his reputation or honor and character any more than of his money and his possessions. He would have every man maintain his self-respect before his wife, his children, his servants, and his neighbors. It is first and simplest meaning. So when thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. In its first and simplest meaning, as the words stand, you shall not bear false witness. This commandment pertains to public courts of justice, where a poor innocent man is accused and maligned by false witnesses and consequently punished in his body or property uh, or honor. This problem appears to concern us only a little at present, but among the Jews it was extremely common. That nation had an excellent, orderly government, and even now, where there is such a government, instances of this sin still occur. The reason is this. Where judges, mayors, princes, or others in authority sit in judgment, we always find that true to the usual course of the world, men are loath to offend anyone. Instead, they speak dishonestly with an eye to gaining favor, money, prospects, or friendships. Consequently, consequently a poor man is inevitably oppressed, loses his case, and then suffers punishment. And it, it is the universal misfortune of the world that men of integrity seldom preside in courts of justice. A judge ought to, above all, be a man of integrity and not only upright, but also a wise, sagacious, brave, and fearless man. Likewise, a witness should be fearless. More than that, he should be an upright man. He who is to administer justice equitably in all cases will often offend good friends, relatives, neighbors, and the rich and the powerful who are in a position to help or to harm him. He must therefore be quite blind, shutting his eyes and his ears to everything but the evidence presented and make his decision accordingly. Okay? 
The first application of this commandment, then, is that everyone should help his neighbor maintain his rights. He must not allow these rights to be thwarted or distorted, but should promote and resolutely guard them, whether he be judge or witness. Let the consequences be what they may. Here we have a goal set for our jurists, perfect justice. That's the goal you know, in our judicial system, by the way, perfect justice and equity in every case. They should let right remain right, not perfect perverting or concealing or suppressing anything on account of anyone's money, property, honor, or power. You don't show preference to the poor. You don't show preference to the rich, right? This is one aspect of the commandment and its plainest meaning applying to all that takes place in court. Next, next understanding of thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Next, it extends much further when it is applied to spiritual jurisdiction and administration. Here too, Everyone bears false witness against his neighbor. Wherever there are godly preachers and Christians, they must endure having the world call them heretics, apostates, even seditious and accursed scoundrels. Moreover, the word of God must undergo the most shameful and spiteful persecution and blasphemy. It is contradicted, perverted, misused, and misinterpreted. But let this pass. It is the blind world's nature to condemn and persecute the truth and the children of God, and yet consider this to be no sin. The third aspect of this commandment, and here's the part that really we need to focus in on in this discussion. The third aspect of this commandment concerns us all. It forbids all sin, sins of the tongue, by which we may injure or offend our neighbor. False witness is, a, is clearly a work of the tongue. Whatever is done with the tongue against a neighbor, then, is forbidden by God. This applies to false preachers with their corrupt teaching and blasphemy, to false judges and witnesses with their corrupt behavior in court, and their lying and malicious talk outside of court. It applies particularly to detestable, shameful vice of backbiting, or slander by which the devil rides us. Of this much could be said. It is a common vice of human nature that everyone would rather hear evil than good about his neighbor. Evil though we are, we cannot tolerate having evil spoken of us. We want the golden compliments of the whole world yet we cannot bear to hear the best spoken of others. So to avoid this vice, therefore, we should note that nobody has the right to judge and reprove his neighbor publicly, even when he has seen a sin committed, unless he has been authorized to judge and to reprove. Those are called backbiters who are not content just to know, but to rush ahead and to judge. Learning a bit of gossip about someone else, they spread it into every corner, relishing and delighting in it like pigs that roll in the mud and root around in it with their snouts. This is nothing else than usurping the judgment and office of God, pronouncing the severest kind of verdict and sentence, for the harshest verdict a judge can pronounce is to declare somebody to be a thief or a murderer, a traitor, etc. Whoever therefore ventures to accuse his neighbor of such guilt assumes as much authority as the emperor and all magistrates. For though you do not wield the sword, you use your venomous tongue to the disgrace and harm of your neighbor. Therefore, God forbids you to speak evil about another, even though to your certain knowledge he is guilty. All the more urgent is the prohibition if you are not sure, but have it only on hearsay. But you say, why shouldn't I speak if it is the truth? I reply, why don't you bring it before the regular judge? Oh, I, I cannot prove it publicly. I might be called a liar and sent away in disgrace. Ah, now do you smell the roast? If you do not trust yourself to make your charges before the proper authorities, then hold your tongue. You keep your knowledge to yourself and do not give it out to others. For when you repeat a story that you cannot prove, even if it is true, you appear to be as a liar. Besides, you act like a knave, for no man should be deprived of his honor and good name unless these have first been taken away from him publicly by the right authorities. Every report then that cannot be adequately proved is a false witness. No one should publicly assert as truth what is not publicly substantiated. Therefore, if you encounter somebody with a worthless tongue who gossips and slanders someone, rebuke him straight to his face and make him blush. 
for shame. Then you will silence many a one who would otherwise bring some poor man into disgrace from which he would scarcely clear himself. For honor and good name are easily taken away, but they are not easily restored. So I would note then that this definition of racism strips slanderously all white people and any flag-waving patriot, regardless of their skin color, and our founding fathers, it strips them of their honor and brings them their good names into disrepute. And the whole thing is slanderous because it can't be substantiated. It is a flat-out myth, and I mean it an absolute slanderous myth that the entire U.S. Constitution was founded, created out of racism for the purpose of perpetuating racism. It's a lie. It's a straight out slander. It's a breaking of God's commandment. And it's not on me to prove my innocence. It's on them to provide the evidence to substantiate and establish their charge, but they can't because this idea, the founding fathers sitting around going, you know, racism is the best thing ever. How, how do we, how do we perpetuate this? I know. Let's let's declare independence from England and and write a constitution and form a government all created around white privilege and oppressing people of different skin color. That's a myth. It's a slanderous myth. And so coming back then to D'Angelo, listen to, so this is a woman who's out there training U.S. corporations about institutionalized racism. And what is she doing here? And when somebody is accused by her falsely of being a racist, because it is false, it's slander. She doesn't actually establish the charge. She doesn't bring real evidence or witnesses. She can't. She just strips people like all social justice warriors and CRT people. They strip people of their good name without any due process. And then when they provide evidence to the contrary that the, the accusations that are being leveled against them are false, they dismiss it out of hand and say, well, that's proof of your, of your guilt. And I would ask you this question. Think about it. If these people are successful in getting rid of the U.S. Constitution and the current judicial system, what will they replace it with? They'll replace it with a system where evidence doesn't mean anything. You will have no ability to defend yourself. You, are, you will be guilty with no way of, quote, proving your innocence. But the whole reason why... The whole reason why the judicial system is set up on this premise, you are innocent until proven guilty, is because everybody in logic knows you can't prove a negative. Can't. It's absolutely inequitable and uncharitable and unfair and unjust. But what she is proposing in this video is you are guilty because I say so, she says. Because I've come up with the definition of racism that says you're guilty of racism and don't you dare provide any evidence to the contrary. Sorry, I don't have to prove my innocence. You have to prove my guilt and you haven't done that. So let's back it up. Listen to what she says. Superficial things that we say, and you probably recognize some of these, you hear them, maybe you've said them yourself. I don't see color. I was taught to treat everybody the same. I don't care if you're pink, blue, purple, polka dotted. My parents weren't racist, that's why I'm not racist. Or my parents were racist, that's why I'm not racist. It doesn't really matter what goes in front of it. The answer is always, I'm not racist. I know people of color, I used to work, uh, I don't have to prove I'm not a racist. You have to prove I am. You have to establish your charge with actual witnesses. Good luck on that. Uh, in the military, all of the things we say to rationalize um, that we ourselves are not complicit in this system. Now I wanna to speak to two. You haven't established the fact that the system itself was actually created for the purpose of perpetuating racism. That's an allegation you have not substantiated. Two of these before I kind of take us below the surface of the dock. And one is this idea that our parents taught us to treat everyone the same. And I am just going to put it out there like this. No, they didn't. That is not humanly possible. Human beings are not objective. You cannot be taught to treat or to see everyone the same. 
Really? Can you prove it? I'd like you to prove it. Because that's exactly what we Gen Xers were taught to do. And let, let me explain. I didn't grow up during the time of segregation. I grew up in the aftermath of it. I grew up in the 1970s in Los Angeles during the time when they were busing people for desegregation purposes to help those people whose families were stuck in bad school systems and to give them the ability to get a good education. I, my stepfather, the man who raised me, he, yeah, he grew up in Memphis in the South during racial segregation. And he was so disgusted by it, he ended up marching with Dr. Martin Luther King. He even joined the Peace Corps. And in my house, even the slightest whiff of racism, well, Let's just say that my stepdad came down hard on any of that. He wouldn't tolerate even the slightest sniff of racism. So how can you speak so authoritatively regarding my experience and say that my experience and what I was taught isn't what I was taught? What evidence do you have to the contrary? You have to establish your charge. I don't have to prove my innocence. And when you say that, you're indicating that you don't understand how socialization works, which is actually a positive thing in the sense that that can direct what you would need to focus on if you want to get deeper understanding. You're just not smart enough because you don't understand how socialization works. You're guilty of being a racist and you don't even know it. And stop trying to provide evidence to prove your innocence. Andy. The other one I want to speak to is this common trope of, I don't care if you're pink, purple, polka dotted. If that's in your vocabulary, I would urge you to please drop it and never say it again. Although it isn't intentional. Again, these are people who are trying to defend themselves against your slander. That's their natural first inclination. And the issue here is your slander. That's the problem. It's actually very demeaning. People don't come in those colors. And what it conveys is that you're not prepared this is what we call being sanctimonious. To engage with authenticity, okay? And that's why I have this image of a dock, right? That's very superficial surface. And for me, in trying to understand how all this works, what it means to be white um, and live so separate by race, even though I have, was taught to see myself individually as open-minded and outside of all of this, I've had to go under the surface. And that's why I have this image here now of under the water, you see the pier, the pillars or posts that prop up the surface, okay? So, for example, it's very common in, in discussions of race to have white people tell you about all the people of color in their lives. Right because you've slandered them and accused them of being racist. Right? Oh, I have these coworkers, or my best friend, or my second cousin married a black man, or all of the ways that we want everyone to know that we have relationships with people of color, okay? And so we're giving you evidence. Right, why? Because they've been charged with a sin, hating their neighbor. But you haven't provided actual evidence that shows that they've, they're guilty of actual racism. So when they provide evidence, it's their natural inclination to defend themselves against the slanderous false charge. The problem isn't their presenting the evidence. The problem is your slander. Right. When someone gives you, tells you that, they're giving you evidence. And so what are they giving you evidence of? They're giving you evidence that because they love people of color, know and love people of color, they can't be racist. Right. Exactly. Hating your neighbor is an actual sin. Which means they see racism as conscious dislike or explicit bias or hatred. Right. Because that's what it is. Right? And they're, they're communicating to you that they don't have conscious dislike or hatred. Correct. You know, just like I can say, you know, the commandment says thou shalt not steal. And I've never consciously stolen any, but anything from anyone. So what are you talking about? as evidenced by all of these people in their lives. And what we don't understand is the power of implicit bias. Most bias is unconscious. So you, you, you actually hate people who have different skin color than you. You just don't know it. 
You see, consciously, you think you love them. Consciously, you have no problem hanging out with them. But unconsciously, you actually hate them. You see what this is, what this is here? This is magic. She is literally arguing that you are a racist, you just don't know it. You are a racist, despite the fact that everything in your life says the contrary. You, you just don't know it because you, 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 you're, you're unaware of it. But she is. She, she is aware of it. How, she can't prove this. The, in order to establish a charge, you have to establish it with two or more witnesses. What evidence do you have? Aside from this magic theory of yours that, they, that people are unconsciously uh, racist, despite the fact that all of their actions say otherwise, what evidence can you provide to prove that they actually secretly, subconsciously, actually hate everybody? That it doesn't have the same skin color they do? Power of implicit bias. Most bias is unconscious. And that makes it very, very dangerous because it drives our behaviors, but we're not aware of it. Yes, it's wonderful to have people of color in your life if you're white. Many, many, many people, white people, don't have people of color in close relationships. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying here? The issue here is the flagrant breaking of God's commandments. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you have created a system, an entire theory regarding racism that makes people racist without them actually having any conscious hatred. In fact, the opposite in their life of people who have a different skin color than they do. And you've also lied about the history of the United States, claiming that the United States, the entire system was created by racism, racism for the purpose of perpetuating racism. So... <laughs> To kind of wrap this up, it's really simple. When you know your Ten Commandments, you know what God's law really says, then you don't have to defend yourself against these false charges, and you can say that. So when somebody accuses you, well, you're a white person, you, you, you're a racist, you basically say to them, Scripture says, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In order to establish a charge, you need two or more witnesses. Provide your evidence to prove that I'm a racist. Good luck. It ain't going to happen because it's a myth. It's a slanderous lie. It's not true. This isn't justice. This is injustice. And I hope you found this helpful. Thank you for your time.